need for this. and the need for this uh, topic had uh, rise and following the recent controversial approval of aducam aducanumab the newest dementia drug which is monoclonal antibody against amyloid beta plugs so it's it will be really interesting to listen to you about this and uh, i would like to take this opportunity to especially thank dr anuprabha vikramasinghe who is a senior lecturer in psychiatry and the head of department of the rajarata medical university and um, she herself is an old age psychiatrist with a certificate of completion of training in the uk as an old age psychiatrist and um, i got to know that she has been even working with you in the uk and uh, thank you very much anuprabha for organizing this special lecture and inviting professor robert howard to talk to us which is a great privilege to all of us and for organizing and facilitating this over to you professor howard thank you so i'll just share my screen it might take a moment to find everything Here we go. So, good evening, everybody. Of course, it's afternoon here in London. Um, I should warn you, I'm giving this talk from my kitchen um, in, in Camberwell because we're still being discouraged from going into the university because of the COVID precautions. So, if anybody comes to the door, you'll hear my dog barking, and I, I apologise for that. But she only barks for a few moments. And I want, to, yes, as as thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm going to talk um, about the questions that I think you should ask yourself. Um, when you're presented with a clinical trial and you want to sort of appraise what, what, what it means. Um, as, as you mentioned, I work at the Division of Psychiatry at UCL. Um, you're very welcome to email me if you ever have any questions or you, you, you want to, to talk about anything with me. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, um, at Prof. Rob Howard is my, um, my, my, tw my Twitter address. And um, I'm very proud that my children are half Sri Lankan. Um, this is, this is my daughter, Rebecca, who um, is just coming to the end of the foundation training in, in, in medicine. I think she's probably going to be a geriatric physician rather than a psychiatrist, which is a bit disappointing to me, but uh, she loves old people and communicating with them. And my son, Michael, he's, um, he, he's totally rejected a career in medicine and, and works for the BBC. He's, he wants to become a film director one day. But um, the great thing about having kids who are half Sri Lankan is they, they're, they're so beautiful and, and cool. I never thought I would have kids who looked as cool as my half Shrankin kids do. So if you're a dementia uh, doctor, it's terribly important that you understand what the clinical trials uh, are telling us about treatment. As I've said, and I'll repeatedly say, there are five questions that we have to ask ourselves about each trial, and I'll go through those. And then I'll talk very briefly about the advent of the new disease modifying treatments. So aducanumab is the first drug to be, to be approved and really what happens when you apply those five questions to, to those treatments. And I know very few of you are old age psychiatrists, but just, it's just important to understand that about 25 years ago, um, the Nepazil, Aricept, was approved, one of the, the first of the cholinesterase inhibitors. And quite quickly after that, there were two other galantamine and rivastigmine, also cholinesterase symptoms were, were approved. And then memantine was, was approved in 2003. And really since then, we haven't had any new approved drugs for dementia. So almost throughout my career, we've been waiting, 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 always told that we're just a few years away from a breakthrough treatment for Alzheimer's disease, but somehow it never comes. And you'll see there was a drug that was approved in 2014, Namzarek, that's just basically a combination of denepazil and memantine in the same tablets, isn't really a new treatment. So when you look at a trial, the first question to ask yourself, and this might seem like um, a question you don't have to ask, is, is the, was the trial a positive or negative trial? And what we'll see, and what you'll see when you look at studies, is that sometimes the authors of trials aren't very clear themselves about whether or not their trials have been positive or negative. And sometimes they, they, go, they work quite hard to kind of hide the fact that it's been negative. Nobody wants to have um, a negative trial. And sometimes people will try and spin a trial that, that is truly negative as being positive by, by fishing out some secondary outcomes that might have been positive, even though the primary outcome was negative. But I like to think that the results of every trial can be summarized by a single graph of the, the main outcome measure, 
and two, two, two lines on that graph, one showing what happened to patients who got drug and one who, patients who got placebo. And I, well, if, I, if I ever try to visualize a trial, I will summon up in my mind that primary outcome graph. Now the trial is only positive, it can only be considered positive, if there's significant efficacy demonstrated on the primary outcome measure. So that's to say there's a statistically significant difference um, on the primary outcome measure at the, the outcome time that was pre-specified. And that positivity has to be on um, a per protocol analysis. So the analysis that was planned before the study was completed, all the available data from all the randomized participants, not just from selected um, subsets of participants and certainly not from post hoc analyses that are done after the fact and after you've had an opportunity to, to look at the data and, and think about it. And really to illustrate that point, I want to show you a graph from one of my own trials. And um, I also want to just reflect with you how difficult it is sometimes as a trialist to be objective about what trial data show. So these are data from a trial called the MAGE trial. And this was a trial of the antibiotic minocycline in Alzheimer's disease. So there are lots of theories as to why people get Alzheimer's disease, but, but one of them involves the idea that um, inside the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease, there's um, aberrant uh, sort of reactivity of microglia. So there's inflammation in the brain driven by these abnormal microglia. And that inflammation actually damages neurons and results in, in cell loss that we see as Alzheimer's disease. And there's a lot of um, animal and, uh, and cell culture evidence that if you take um, sort of models of Alzheimer's disease and you treat them with minocycline, you can make a difference. So mice who have been genetically modified to get Alzheimer's disease, if you treat them with high doses of minocycline, you can show a slowing in the progression of the pathology and an improvement in, in some of the symptoms. So in this trial, we took 560 people with very early Alzheimer's disease. So they all had a mini mental state of 26 or greater. So at the most early stage in their dementia. And they were treated for two years with um, either minocycline, at a very high dose of 400 milligrams a day for two years, 200 milligrams a day or placebo. And this graph just shows what happened to the mini mental state score in those groups. So the red line shows people who got the highest dose, the 400 milligrams. The blue line shows the 200 milligrams and the green line shows the placebo participants. And what you can see is that everybody in the study got worse, didn't matter what treatment you got. But actually, if you look at the, the 400 milligram line, the red line, you can see that by 24 months, it's actually separated from the placebo and lower dose minocycline groups. And I have to say, when I first saw these data, I got very excited and thought, well, we found a treatment that really makes a difference in Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, that was a mis that would have been very misleading um, if, 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 if that had been my only conclusion. It turns out that 400 milligrams of minocycline is actually quite a difficult uh, high dose to take. And only 28% of the participants who started the two years treatment with a high dose completed the high dose. And if you included all the data from all the patients, including those who, who didn't manage to stay on the minocycline for the full 24 months, there was no difference, no statistically significant difference between the high dose minocycline and the other two lines. And this graph shows you the people who managed to stay on the minocycline for the full two years. And there's all sorts of reasons why people who do well in trials tend to be, be biased towards staying on treatment, even if they're suffering side effects. So I show you this graph just because even though it looks like a positive result. And if I'd been um, interested in sort of scientific um, dodginess and fraud, I could have presented this as a positive trial. But luckily the statisticians would have stopped me from doing that because they'd have said, no, 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 no. When you look at all the data in every participant, there's no difference between uh, minocycline as a high dose or a low dose or placebo. So we must report the trial as being a negative trial. So the second question is, what was what in, in the particular indication that you're looking at, so I'm talking about Alzheimer's disease trials, so it'll generally be cognitive function is the uh, outcome we're interested in. What was the minimum clinically important difference that you should expect to see in that study? And was it exceeded? And the minimum clinically important difference is the smallest change that you could attribute to treatment 
that would make it worthwhile giving a patient that treatment. And just in broad terms, it's often defined as well as the smallest um, difference in a, in a patient you'd actually expect to be able to see. And just to show you how tiny those differences often are, these graphs show data from um, the, the, the early studies of Denepiza or Aricept in the, in, the, in the 1990s. And if you look at the panel on the left, what that shows you is the change in a, in a cognitive score called the ADAS COG, which is a kind of research score that nobody uses in clinical practice. Um, and along the uh, x-axis is, is time in, in weeks, and on the y-axis is change on that ADAS COG score. And there are three lines here. So the open circles show placebo, the triangles show people who got 5 milligrams of dezinepazil, and the circles people who got 10 milligrams of dezinepazil. Uh, going up is improvement, going down is declining. And what I hope you can see is that all three groups appear to get better in the first six weeks, because that's the placebo response that everybody gets. But then after that, there's a separation between placebo and the tizinepazil groups. So 24 weeks, you can see there's a difference of about two or three points on the ADAS cog between the people who got tizinepazil and placebo. Now, because none of us really have a feel for what three points on the ADAS cog means, um, it's quite difficult when we first saw these graphs to know well, what would that mean in our individual patients we saw in the clinic. <coughs> the graph on the right shows you what happens if you do a similar sort of study, but this time you use the mini mental state instead of the ADAS cog as your, as your scale, because we all know what one or two points on the mini mental state looks like. And what you can see, I hope, from the panel on the right is that if the black, the black line show people, the black circles, people who got the nepazil, the open circles, we've got placebo. So at every point during this other study, this is the AG2000 study, you can see the people who got denepazil were doing better than people who got placebo. But I hope you can also see that difference is tiny. It's about 0.8 of a mini mental state point. So the question has to be, what would the minimum clinically important difference be for the treatment of people with dementia with a cognosphase inhibitor? And is an average difference of 0.8 of a mini mental state point, is that enough? Did that exceed the minimum clinically important difference? So that's your second question. Your first question, is this a positive trial? Second question, how big was the difference between drug and placebo? And did it exceed the minimum clinically important difference? The third question is a sort of sneaky question, and that's how good was allocation blinding? So everybody who does a trial will tell you it was a double blind trial, and that uh, the participants and the people who did the assessments and the participants' family members didn't know whether the patients they were looking after had been allocated to drug or placebo. But actually, sometimes it's very hard to maintain that blinding allocation. Now, this is a graph from um, a study of a drug which is essentially methylene blue. So you'll be familiar with methylene blue. I remember when I was um, a young doctor, methylene blue was, was, was given to people who had um, bone infections. So that when the orthopedic surgeons operated on them and looked at how much of the bone had been affected by the infection, they would see the blue dye that had been taken up by the living bits of the bone, but the dead bits of the bone that they could then cut out would still be white. So I can remember giving patients methylene blue um, about 30 years ago when I was doing orthopedics as a house officer. But it turns out that methylene blue isn't just good for colouring people's bones. It's also a good way of blocking um, the phosphorylation of tau to make uh, tangles in Alzheimer's disease. So it's been suggested that it could be a great treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And this is a trial from a, a group who are very interested in looking at methylene blue. And what you can see they did was they treated people with um, Alzheimer's disease for 18 months. And they looked at, um, they used the ADAS cog as a sort of cognitive measure. And what I hope you can see on this graph is a blue line, which are the patients who got methylene blue treatment, and a black line, which shows patients who got placebo. And placebo was only given for a year. Um, and then they sort of extrapolated on sort of about how they thought um, the placebo people should have deteriorated. And um, what this purports to show is a really interesting and positive um, separation between the drug and placebo lines. And so when this data was first presented, I can remember being quite excited about this and thinking, wow, this, look, this is what disease course modification would look like. You can see a separation of the lines and you can see as time goes on, the lines are diverging. So the, you've really changed the slope of decline. 
But the more we found out about this trial, the more anxious we became about um, um, allocation blinding. And, and uh, of course, if you take methylene blue, you turn blue. And even if you don't turn blue, your urine turns green and your motions are blue. So it would have been very obvious to patients and the people looking after them, whether they've been randomized to get the drug or placebo. And it was also quite obvious to people who went to their homes to, to make the assessments about whether they were drug or placebo. So when these trials were performed using um, placebos that were also blue and also dyed the patient blue, there were no differences between drug and placebo. So here's, here's an example of an apparent effect, which is you know, sadly, and completely explained by the breaking of the blind. So how good was allocation blinding is a really important question, certainly in dementia trials. Then the next question is, obviously one's very interested in looking at what happens to the group of patients who get the active drug. Sometimes it's really important also to look at what happened in the placebo group. So always ask yourself, what happened in the placebo group? And did what happened in the placebo group explain the apparent positive results in the trial. So this is a study of a drug called pimavanserin. And pimavanserin is a is a, a 5-HT2 um, and 3 um, inverse agonist. So it basically blocks 5-HT2 and 5-H3 receptors. And it's it's got a license for the treatment of psychosis in Parkinson's disease. And at the moment, the company that make it, Acadia, are trying very hard to get a license for the treatment of psychosis in Alzheimer's disease, which would be a much bigger market than the Parkinson's disease psychosis um, sort of market is. And here's one of the studies that they did. They took people with um, Alzheimer's disease who were living in care homes who had psychosis symptoms, and they treated them for 12 weeks with pimavanserin. And what this graph shows is the people who got pimavanserin, they're the red line, and people got placebo. And um, going down, so a, a drop in score, is a good thing in this case you've got fewer psychosis symptoms and if you look at this graph you can see how lucky it was that they pre-specified that the primary outcome would be at six weeks because six weeks was the only point when there was an apparently significant difference between pimvanserin and placebo. So, so Anoja, can you mute your thank you so let's look at, at closely at what happened at six weeks, which is the point where the investigators are claiming they're seeing a significant difference between drug and placebo. When I look at these data, what I actually see is um, that there's nothing particularly special happening in the Pimvanserin group at six weeks, but there is, for some strange reason, an apparent worsening in the placebo group at six weeks. And there's no reason why the placebo group should worsen at six weeks other than just by chance. So the apparent positive finding in this study and the, the apparent significant result is driven entirely by a chance event that's occurring in the placebo group at six weeks. And that's why it's so important to look at what happened in the placebo group. So this was reported and it was published in the Lancet Neurology as a positive trial, but it isn't really. It's a negative trial with a spurious result that's arisen by chance because of what happened in the placebo group. And then the last question you must ask yourself, and it may seem like a rather cynical and nasty question, is do you believe the results? Sometimes trials are literally unbelievable and you shouldn't believe them. So these are the results from a, a compound which is it's just called GV971. It's made by a Chinese drug company called Green Valley. And um, it's made from um, a kind of seaweed. And the way it's meant to work is by it, it corrects abnormalities in the, the microbiome in your, in your gut. And that correction reduces the amount of inflammation that you have in your, in your body, in particular in your brain. And that is meant to reverse your Alzheimer's disease. And this, 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 these are the results of one of the sort of phase two trials that have been carried out with this drug, which, which has a license in China. Um, for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see is that, again, in terms of improvement, both the placebo and the drug group appear to improve for the first 24 weeks. But after that, there's a big difference um, on the right-hand side of this graph you'll see between the drug and placebo. And, you know, that's, this is an interesting finding. Um, I mean, it's quite hard to explain, quite hard to explain why people should get uh, so much better so quickly um, from correction of a microbiome abnormality 
And when you dig around a bit and 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 you look into the the people involved in the study, you find that this this a professor who, who who led the trial team has actually had multiple um, uh, investigations for scientific fraud. And e even though she's quite a senior Chinese scientist and presumably quite protected by the government, um, when, when she was caught out doing image manipulations and and, and using the same image over and over again in, in, in some of her, her, her papers, um, it was announced that she was going to be educated about scientific integrity and formally criticised. I think what that means is she's somebody whom we should be extremely cautious about believing the results from her studies, particularly if they look too good to be true. So I'm sorry to say this, but sometimes you really do have to ask yourself if you should really believe what people are trying to tell you. So that's my fifth question. So I want to talk now about aducanumab. So aducanumab is this, this, this one, one of these... Um, amyloid antibodies that goes into the brain, binds with um, am amyloid. This then initiates a kind of an immune response. And so the body's immune system sort of moves in and um, di you know, digests and removes that amyloid. And there's no doubt that aducanumab does remove amyloid from the brain. So if you look at the left-hand side, so this, this is very unusual that a, that a phase one trial makes it to the cover of nature. But in 2016, the first aducanumab study, which is really just a safety and dose ranging study, it made, as you can see, onto the cover of nature. If you look at the left hand half of this image um, and look at the first um, column, what that shows is, is baseline PET um, amyloid scans. So uh, amyloid is kind of red or orange on these scans. And if you look at the column next to it, the one year column, what that shows is is the effect of increasing um, milligram per kilogram doses of aducanumab given over a year to patients. And you can see the placebo um, brain scan at one year looks exactly like the baseline one. But by the time you get down to 10 milligrams per kilogram, you can see there's no red or orange on the brain. So the amyloid has been effectively removed. And on the basis of that, uh, Biogen, the company that make aducanumab started these two, two huge phase three trials so um, as you can see, 3,285 patients initially wanted to recruit all around the world. I don't see Sri Lanka there in blue on that map or, 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 or India, but you can see certainly Japan um, was, 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 an, was an Asian center and, and, and see Australia was also involved. Um, and they set up these two studies that were absolutely identical. And the reason for that is that the FDA will often ask before they give a license, they'll often ask you to show efficacy in at least one trial. So they set up these two trials, emerge and engage. And the primary outcome measure of those trials was something called the, um, the clinical dementia rating scale, sum of boxes, basically a cognitive um, score, which, which, which rates the severity of someone's dementia. And an increasing score on that study is a bad thing. And so what I hope you can see on these two graphs, it's one for emerge and one for engage, is um, a grey line. Well, all the lines go up, which shows everyone's getting worse. And there's a purple line and a blue line. And the, um, the purple line is high dose aducanumab. And the blue line is low dose aducanumab. And the grey line is placebo. Now, interestingly, both of these trials were stopped about halfway through because of futility. So the, 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 the company did a kind of, they went in, they looked at the data, did a kind of preliminary analysis of the data. And what that showed was there was a less than 20% chance that either of the trials would have a positive outcome. So they stopped the studies. Well, they stopped recruiting into the studies. But of course, people who were already in the studies were allowed to continue. So that happened in March, 2019, they announced they'd stopped the studies. In November, 2019, they announced that they'd gone back and they looked, now they had a chance to collect a bit more data. What they'd found was that the emerged trial was now positive, but the engaged trial had remained absolutely negative. But interestingly, they, they wouldn't release the data. So they wouldn't show scientists the data. They gave presentations at Alzheimer's disease conferences where they expressed the data in terms of percentage changes rather than absolute amounts. And they wouldn't answer any questions. They were only, the only questions that were allowed were questions that had been pre-agreed with, uh, with the company. So it was a very, very peculiar uh, way of presenting data and very hard to understand what had happened given the, 
the, the, the, the both trials being stopped for futility. And the way um, Biogen, the company, explained the fact that um, Emerge appeared positive and Engage appeared negative was that during the life of these trials, there have been a number of um, what's the word, um, amendments of the protocol. And the final amendment to protocol version four um, allowed them to give higher doses of aducanumab to people who carry the APOE for um, genotype. And we'll talk in a moment about why that there was, a, there was a restriction in that. And because as you can see, even though the studies are very identical, um, the EMERGE trial started one month after the ENGAGE trial. And their claim was, listen, because the EMERGE trial was later, more patients in that trial than the other one were able to get access to this higher dose of aducanumab. And that's the reason that we got a positive result. But as we'll see later, that, that, that just isn't true. But as you can imagine, very, very contentious. And as soon as this data started to be presented, um, the field of Alzheimer's disease research became divided. And nobody could really, well, there was a huge disagreement about whether this was the most exciting thing that had happened for 50 years or whether the drug is essentially just a placebo that has unpleasant side effects. But people agreed that um, it was very, very difficult when you've got two identical trials. If one is negative, it's very hard to ignore that. What it means is that a positive trial may very well be positive just by chance. Secondly, people agreed that the company's habit of expressing drug placebo differences as percentages, so saying there was a 20% reduction in this rather than giving the absolute amount, obscured the size of any absolute benefit. And it was also extraordinary the way Biogen, the company who, who makes the drug, completely controlled the presentation to data. And unless you've been following the news, this you may not know this, but um, they still haven't published the data uh, in, in a, in a peer-reviewed journal. They did submit the, paper, uh, the data to, um, to JAMA, but um, after they were asked to make changes by reviewers and the, and the editors, they then withdrew the paper. So they're obviously going to try and find a journal that will publish it without making any, any changes. So it's very, very divisive and difficult. So in November of last year, the FDA, who were considering whether or not to give a license uh, to aducanumab for Alzheimer's disease, uh, they, had a, they had a meeting of their advisory committee. And at that meeting, their, their own statistician, so the internal statistician of the FDA, advised that the apparently positive trial was most likely due to the fact that um, there had been an accelerated decline in the placebo group after that last amendment. So the differences between the trials weren't to do with more patients getting access to the higher dose of Hachikano, they were about, they were because of a completely random uh, increase in decline in the placebo group. Remember that question I told you to ask about what happened to the placebo group. And the FDA statistician was also concerned about um, inadvertent unblinding from ARIA. So ARIA, uh, uh, the, the acronym means amyloid related um, imaging abnormalities. So when you give a drug like aducanumab with Alzheimer's disease, it produces an inflammatory response in the brain. And, you, and I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. Um, and it also causes cognitive, a worsening of cognitive impairment. People can become quite ill. And when those things are spotted on MRI scan, um, they, it, it's, very, it's very important that, that the dose is, is reduced and, and sometimes have to be given steroids. So as you can see, that would have been a huge potential for unblinding of people on the highest dose. So the FDA, because they can't be experts on everything, they convene these advisory committees who are people who are experts in an area but don't work for the FDA. There were 11 members of the panel, all experts in Alzheimer's disease, who came to this November meeting, and they were asked to vote on whether or not the data that Biogen had produced, the trial data, um, had established efficacy. And they voted 10, said no, it hadn't, and one said that he was unsure. So that's basically a unanimous vote against efficacy. So it looked at that point like um, aducanumab was dead. To everyone's amazement, um, just last month, in June 2021, the FDA announced that they were, they were going to approve aducanumab, but they would approve it under this thing called the accelerated approval pathway. So to be approved of that pathway, you don't have to show that the drug works 
only that the, there's a possibility or a chance that it might work. So they've approved anucanemab on the basis of its ability to reduce brain amyloid, not because they think it works against Alzheimer's disease. And what they say is there's an expectation that amyloid clearance will improve cognition and function and reduce the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So let's apply our five questions to the aducanumab data. And the first question, of course, is were these trials positive? Well, remember what I said to you is that the, a trial is only positive if an analysis involving all of the data is still positive. And because Emerge and Engage were identical trials, it isn't right to consider them in isolation. We have to pull them. And when you pull them, there's no longer a statistically significant result. So that, the answer to our first question is, the, you know, the, these, this, this, this is this is a negative um, overall data set. Our second question, was the minimum clinically important difference achieved? So let's say we're going to kind of believe Biogen's story. We're going to forget there was a negative trial and just look at the one that was supposedly positive. So we're only gonna look at half the data. Um, the difference between drug and placebo was 0.39 of a point on the CDR sum of boxes. And so let's ask ourselves, well, what would 0.39 of a point on that scale look like? And would it establish, a, would, it, would, it, would it be a minimum clinically important difference for us? So if I show you how we use the um, CDR sum boxes to rate Alzheimer's disease, what you can see is it's a scale that you can score between zero and 18 on depending on how severe your dementia was. And I think you can see a score of 0.5 to four is still within the questionable cognitive impairment range. 0.5 to 2.5 questionable impairment, three to four, very mild dementia, 4.5 to nine, mild dementia. You can see just how tiny 0.39 of a point would be in the sort of total spread of people with dementia. So it's a really, really small change. And if you look, so this, this, is, this, this figure is from a, a paper that we published very recently, actually, in, in Lancet Psychiatry, asking about minimum, you know, what are the minimum clinically important differences for dementia studies. And if you look, I don't know if I can move, you can see my arrow moving on the figure, I hope. So what this shows is the minimum clinically important difference on the CDR sum boxes in, um, in patients with mild cognitive impairment, it's 0.98. In um, mild Alzheimer's disease, it's 1.63. And in moderate severe Alzheimer's disease, it's 2.3 points. So that 0.39 that uh, we saw in, in the one positive study is a long way below the minimum clinically important difference. So even if we say aducanumab had efficacy, it certainly didn't achieve effectiveness in terms of reaching that minimum clinically important difference. So, so far it's failed on question one, and on question two, let's look at question three. So was treatment allocation blinding maintained? So I told you something about these um, um, amyloid related imaging abnormalities. And this is just to show you what they look like. So they, they appear as areas of hyperintensity on MRI. You can also see them on PET scans. And let's just look at the very bottom uh, row um, down the bottom here. What you can see, this, this is an individual patient. These are, these are uh, sequential MRI scans taken of this patient. Um, and the going from left to right, when the, just before the patient received the first dose of um, aducanumab, you can see the minimal state was 29 out of 30 in September 2017. But you can see by January 2018, the patient had developed extensive aria. You can see the white in the kind of parietal occipital area and in the frontal lobes. And he didn't have a repeat mini at that point, but on the mocha, uh, his score had dropped to 22 out of 30. And you can see through January, um, continued, the, 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 um, they became more extensive, the, the lesions, um, and, and his mocha score remained depressed. And then you can see he, he started treatment with methylprednisolone to try and reduce the inflammation. And by February, 2018, the, um, you, can, you can see the, um, the aria were resolving and cognition was recovering and improving. But that patient would have had to have their, their treatment stopped and um, would have had to have, have gone on to intravenous methylprednisolone. It'd be impossible to mask the fact that they were taking, that they're receiving active drug 
rather than placebo. So this is a trial where treatment allocation blindly cannot have been maintained. 35 to 40% of people in the study got these abnormalities. Now, question four was, that was, was to ask, you, ask yourself, what happened in the placebo group? And can changes between drug and placebo be, um, be explained in terms of the behavior of the placebo group? So remember I told you that Biogen had explained the differences between eMERGE and ENGAGE as being that more patients in the, the later trial, the eMERGE trial, were able to take advantage of that, that fourth protocol change and were therefore exposed to higher doses of, so more of them got the top dose of um, aducanumab, which, which means that more of them were able to take advantage of the, the therapeutic treatment, and that's why one trial did better than the other. Actually, when you look at, at what happened, so if, if, you can see there are three panels in this graph. The left-hand one shows the people who got placebo, um, and going up on this graph is a bad thing. It means more decline on the CDR sum of boxes. And what you can see there is that the decline, the red decline, which is the people uh, who entered the trial post that, um, that, that fourth protocol variation, actually deteriorated more than the people who were blue, who were the ones who joined the trial earlier. And when you look in the middle panel, which is low-dose aducanumab, and the right-hand panel, which is high-dose aducanumab, what you can see is the red and blue blobs are superimposed indicating that actually there wasn't an advantage to the people who were randomized to get the high dose treatment, whether they came before or after the amendment. The only difference in pre and post amendment is in the placebo group. And it's that the people, the red people who were randomized post that fourth protocol variation were just faster decliners than the placebo group who came before. So again, so important with what happens in the placebo group because because that variation in the placebo group is what has driven the apparent efficacy in that second trial. Then the fifth question, the final question, was the can you believe it question. And the question that you have to ask yourself is, do you believe that reducing brain amyloid levels will result in clinical improvement for patients with Alzheimer's? So there's no doubt aducanumab can reduce brain amyloid, no doubt of that at all. But does that mean anything? Well, interestingly, the FDA statistician, their own statistician, said that there was no convincing linkage association between change in brain amyloid and primary clinical outcomes in the trial. So removing amyloid from the brains of people in those two trials, sort of altogether, I think about two and a half thousand patients, had no, there was no correlation between that and, and apparent improvement in cognition. And that shouldn't have surprised us because there are probably 14 or 15 different um, anti-amyloid treatments that have all been shown to remove amyloid from the brain. Um, and earlier this year, there was um, a meta-analysis in the BMJ looking at all the trials that are targeted amyloid and really trying to see whether or not that had any effect on, um, on, on cognition and subsequent deterioration. And as you can see, reducing amyloid in the brain led on average an improvement of 0.03 of a mini mental state point. And the, you also see the confidence intervals cross zero. So it wasn't significant. And the, the conclusion of that um, meta-analysis, which was available before the FTA approved aducanumab, was that the pooled evidence from available trials reporting both reduction amyloid levels and change in cognition suggest amyloid reduction strategies do not substantially improve cognition. So the FDA have approved this drug on the basis of its ability to remove amyloid and their expectation that that will then have an effect upon cognition, which flies completely in the face of the evidence. So my fifth question, can you believe it? Can you believe that reducing amyloid will improve cognition? That's a no too. <laughs> and you know, the arrival of this drug, of course, has generated a kind of existential crisis for our services. It's going to be very expensive, at least 56,000 pounds per year. That's just the cost of the drug. Um, patients will have to have a PET scan at the beginning to establish they've got amyloid in their brains, and they'll probably need at least four or five MRI scans um, joined, joined to monitor to make sure that they're not getting these aria A, and the cost, obviously, of setting up these intravenous infusion centres to give the treatment. Uh, initially, the FDA licensed um, 
the drug for all cases of Alzheimer's disease. Now it's just for MCI and mild AD, but they haven't said how long treatment should be or when it should stop. And you'll have seen from those MRI scans, this is not a totally safe treatment. Uh, even within the clinical trial population, people became unwell. Uh, nobody died of ARIA, but it, I, I don't think it's going to be too long before somebody more frail than people in the trials is exposed to this drug who, who will do very badly. The efficacy is marginal at very best, even if you give a free pass to uh, Biogen's dodgy analyses. And there's no evidence of clinical effectiveness because we didn't get anywhere near the minimum clinically important difference. I'm, as an academic, I'm also worried that um, the, 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 you know, the licensing of this drug is going to set back the discovery of effective dementia treatments by a long time, probably a decade. Um, patients who are in uh, dementia trials are already saying, actually, should I stay in this trial or should I go and ask if I can have aducanumab? Because at least I'm, I, I will be sure I'm not getting a placebo if I go and get that from my doctor. The drug companies who, who are interested in Alzheimer's disease are now either resurrecting their failed amyloid agents or switching drug development to try and produce drugs that copy aducanumab. And the antibodies which um, work against tau, the manufacturers that those are now asking to have the same low bar for approval applied to them as has been applied to aducanumab. So I hope what I've shown you is that if you apply those five questions, you can make sense of even the most complex and contentious data. So by applying these five questions, I hope you'll see we've completely demolished the, the case for aducanumab. So just to repeat them once more, is this a positive or negative result? As, as, as I showed you how you should define that. Were minimum clinically important differences achieved? Was blinding maintained? What happened in the placebo group? And then finally, can or should you believe this result? So thank you for your patience. It's been such a pleasure to um, have spoken to you. And I'll try and stop sharing my screen. Happy to take any questions if you've got them. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Howard. So I'm sure there'll be a few questions um, from the audience. Uh, Professor Howard, uh, thank you very much for that enlightening uh, uh, talk. In fact, I've been very uh, sort of keen to find out the real reasons for this controversy over aducanumab and you've been sort of very clear about it. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, but what I find fascinating is that uh, Alzheimer's Disease International is uh, strongly advocating for this uh, drug to be trialed out or, or rolled out further. Uh, and I think ADI UK is also supporting it. Do you know why that is, uh, Professor Howard? Okay, so, so the first thing to say is the, the, the two Alzheimer charities in the UK, so that's AR UK and the Alzheimer's Society, are not asking for it to be rolled out. What they're asking for is they're asking for the British regulator to look at the data quickly and come to a decision about whether it's going to be made available or not quickly. But they're very alive to the, you know, the difficulties with the data. And, and they also think it's very important that the regulator makes the decision rather than feeling pressurized by the charities. Now, ADI, I don't, I don't know about ADI, but a lot of these organizations um, are heavily funded. So the Alzheimer's Association in the States um, has received something like $1.4 million from Biogen over the last few years. Um, and I, th I think there's a huge conflict of interest, huge conflict of interest, because not only for money they've already received, but money they're going to get going forward. So that's one conflict. The other conflict is if you run a dementia charity, you need good news stories to, to keep up momentum and to keep up people giving you money to pay for research because you're able to point to something that, that, that all that research has led to. So I think there are so many conflicts of interest here that you have to bear in mind. All I'll tell you is all the clinicians uh, in the UK and in the States who I respect um, are all saying that they they won't be giving this, this treatment to their patients. The um, Mount Sinai and the Cleveland Clinic um, announced very early on that based on what they've seen of the e efficacy data, they wouldn't be making it available in their clinics. Hello, you still there? Thank you, Professor.
Yeah, any more questions or comments to Professor Harvard? I mean, I just want to comment, you know, you, maybe you're thinking, well, in Sri Lanka, this is a long way away from thinking about, you know, what we would want to give to our patients. That's the case in the UK too. We're, we wouldn't be set up at all to give a drug that had to be given by infusion where people had to have large numbers of MRI scans to monitor their progress. We, we, we you know, we'd certainly haven't got the um, clinical infrastructure or, 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 or training to be able to, even if we had the funding, to be able to manage that. Professor Howard, what is the hope for a better drug, <laughs> Simons? Well, ob well, obviously, what what we want is drugs that make a big enough difference that we could actually see it, and that our patients and their families could actually notice. But I'm I'm sorry to say that we I knew that we're nowhere near that. Um, I mean, I st I started in dementia research in 1991, and during that time, people have always been telling us we're five years away from a, from a breakthrough and a treatment that's going, but that's, that's 30 years ago. So we always seem to be five years away from treatment. I wouldn't be surprised if we're 50 years away. You know? But I also think when the treatment comes, it will be something unexpected. In the same way as the, um, you know, the, the way the anti-TNF drugs have completely revolutionized uh, rheumatology. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll find something. It'll probably be found by accident, uh, by, by serendipity. If I can use the word serendipity when I'm talking to Sri Lankans. And, um, yes. and because much of medicine has been serendipity, hasn't it? Many drugs that we have were discovered by repurposing or by accident. Um, but we'll find a treatment that makes a difference. And then that will quickly lead to lots of others in the same way as the anti-TNF drugs. So, so in, in my working lifetime, the one group of patients who... Whose, whose management has completely changed have been people with rheumatoid arthritis. When, when I was a young doctor, I did a job looking after rheumatoid patients. And I remember we had no treatment for them when they flared up other than putting them to bed and giving them gold injections. And that, now we have such a range of, of drugs that really make a difference to the disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Howard, for that enlightening presentation. Will there be any possibility of you giving us a second lecture on a clinical topic? Uh, like I read on the internet that uh, you are very much interested in uh, old age psychosis as well as anxiety disorders in old age. So we would very much like, if there's any possibility at all, it will be really nice if you could speak to us for a second time of on course. a clinical topic. Of course. So just let me know when you want me to do it. I'll, I'll talk about... Um, well, what we call very late onset schizophrenia-like psychosis, the, the late onset delusional disorders that we see a lot of in the UK. And I'd be okay. fascinated to know if you see them in Sri Lanka as well. Mm -hmm. And also regarding the recent developments in the treatment of dementia, if possible. Treatment of? Dementia, the advances okay. in the treatment of dementia. Yep. Well, they're only symptomatic treatments, I'm afraid, but I can certainly talk about uh, treatment of psychosis and depression in dementia. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Amila Isuru, have you got a question for Professor Howard? Uh, yes, sir. And Professor Howard, thank you so much for your very enlightening uh, the lecture. So I, I really like the, that uh, clinically clinical improvement or clinical improvement does not correlate with the the, the improvement in the uh, biomarkers. That is, uh, I like that very much. And we, we have read lots of your the old age psychosis articles by Prof. Howard. And I have a, a one uh, question, uh, probably it's not quite related to the dementia, but from your experience, I would like to uh, hear from you uh, the difference between R bands and ASPRI or ADAS-COG uh, in the evaluation of cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia which uh, scale is more sensitive to catch the cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia? Well, that's a very difficult question. Um, 
I don't think either. I mean, both of them are basically developed for um, for dementia rather than for schizophrenia. That's the problem, isn't it? Um, I, I suppose I, I don't have any clinical experience of using the R bands. I mean, I've, I've used the ACE three, the MOC around the mini mental state of the scales that I tend to use. And of course, they have value for me because I'm used to using them and I understand well, I'm confident in their administration. And when I'm giving them to a patient, I kind of get a feeling for the level of deficit from the way they're scoring. So I, I, I think the scale that you're comfortable with and that you like to use is the one that you should use rather than worrying about trying to do a head to head comparison between them. Right. Okay. Uh, Howard, thank you very much. But I, but, I, but I do think cognitive impairment and schizophrenia is completely overlooked. And, yeah. um, and of course, it's much more disabling, particularly when people get older mm. than their delusions and hallucinations. But the problem is they're, they're impaired so globally, aren't they? It's very, very difficult mm. to, to, you know, to, to work out how best to assess them and how best to approach their treatment and rehabilitation. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Anuprabha Vikramasinghe, we'll formally thank you, Professor Howard. Well, it's been a pleasure. And listen, good, good luck with your attempts to set up an old age psychiatry specialty in, in Sri Lanka. And if there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the enthusiasm you have shown from the beginning, you know, to deliver this talk. You no know, problem. It, it was a very easy job to, you know, uh, get him to agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir.